was a 60 plus um, male who did not have a history of travel to places to countries where COVID-19 was already reported. And he also could not remember being exposed to a probable or suspect or confirmed COVID-19 case. But he presented with the symptoms and had himself checked in a tertiary hospital in the national capital region. And true enough, he was um, confirmed to have COVID-19. But because of the absence of the epidemiological criteria, the travel, the contact, um, he did not have any of it. So that was why he was considered the first case of community transmission. And if you remember the story, thereafter, um, family members of his um, were also infected. And that was basically the start of the cases of COVID-19 in um, the NCR, in the, in the national capital region. On March 11, 2020, the WHO declared that COVID-19 was a pandemic. On the right side, you will see the numbers as of yesterday, April 16. So globally, the total number of confirmed cases is now at 138 million plus with about 3 million deaths or a mortality rate of 2.1%. In the country, our numbers as of yesterday, yesterday stands at 914,971 with 15,000 plus deaths or a mortality rate of 1.7%. On the bottom box, you will see the breakdown of the active cases as of yesterday. So as of yesterday, the active cases was at 193,476. And 96% of the active cases as of yesterday are mild cases. So we have to remember that we are getting mild cases. We have more of the mild cases. This is a good, this is actually good news, but we also need to remember that even the mild cases can transmit the virus. So we should not um, lower down our guard just because we have mild cases, because once again, mild cases can still transmit. And our worry is if any of these mild cases transmit the virus to any of our vulnerable population, and these are the people who are 60 years old and above, or they may not be 60 and above, but they have what we call comorbidities like diabetes, chronic lung problems, chronic kidney disease, hypertension. If any of these vulnerable population are infected, these are the people that can actually develop severe or critical illness. And these are usually the population that um, lead to mortality or death. So we really need to protect our vulnerable population as much as we can. We prevent our transmission to them so that we will not be seeing what we saw during the surge last year. Now, this is just to show you the surveillance definitions of COVID-19. Uh, there is a different definition for surveillance purposes, and we also have different definitions for clinical cases. So for surveillance, we have what we call suspect, a probable case, and a confirmed case. So a suspect case is one that presents with the nonspecific symptoms of COVID, with any of the epidemiological criteria like um, travel or residence to a place where COVID-19 cases are reported or contact or exposure to a prob probable or confirmed case. So that is a suspect. A probable case is one that presents with um, <coughs> the nonspecific symptoms of the suspect or these are those patients who in the absence of the RT-PCR positive results, they have other laboratory results that are, that are typical of COVID. So this includes um, diffuse pneumonia seen on chest X-ray, on chest CT scan. So in, in, the, in the hospital, when we have probable cases, even in the absence of the positive RT-PCR results, we actually manage them as a COVID already. More, more so if we see the diffuse pneumonia on X-ray, on chest CT scan, and this is coupled with um, hypoxemia or low oxygen in the blood that we determine when we do a test called arterial blood gases. Because the reason for this particular um, category of patients is that we all know that the, the results of our RT-PCR can take hours or even days before it, it comes out. Um, we cannot wait for the confirmatory before we need to start the medications so that we will be able to save patients who have 
diffuse pneumonia. And then confirmed cases by the by definition is one that has a positive who has a positive PCR uh, result. And then um, surveillance definitions, we also have clinical definitions of what we call confirmed COVID-19 cases. So the asymptomatic, asymptomatic meaning they don't have symptoms, they have positive results, but they don't positive PCR results, but they don't have symptoms. So this is what we call asymptomatic. Mild cases are those that present with what we call non-specific symptoms, and the, the, the severity of the symptoms are considered mild. What is notable of the mild symptoms that we know are very um, um, suspicious of COVID-19 is actually the loss of smell, or what we call anosmia, because this is a symptom that is not reported in other coronavirus infections or other respiratory viral infections like the flu. We don't normally complain of uh, losing our sense of smell when we have the flu or the simple colds or sniffles. But with coronavirus, this is a very typical symptom that we always ask of our patients. And then when it is reported as it being present, we always have the primary condition, uh, the primary consideration of COVID-19. And then we have what we call the moderate. The moderate infection, uh, there are two kinds of moderate. This may be those presenting with the mild symptoms, but to a moderate degree of severity, or those who will present with pneumonia, um, usually mild pneumonia that may or may not be oxygen requiring. So when we say you have moderate um, um, COVID-19, there are two, two types of moderate. Either you have pneumonia or you don't have pneumonia, but your um, non-specific symptoms are considered moderate in comparison to the severity reported in those with mild infection. And then we have the critical confirmed COVID case. These are those with severe pneumonia, no, so, I'm sorry, the severe COVID-19. These are those with severe pneumonia. And by severe pneumonia, we look at certain parameters like increased respiratory rate for adults or adolescents. In children, we see fast breathing, and then we see labored breathing. And then um, we have um, objective parameters like um, oxygen saturation under room air. If oxygen saturation is less than 90%, that is considered severe. For everybody's information, I think most of you know that we can measure the peripheral oxygen saturation by way of a very simple gadget we call pulse oximeter. And then uh, by knowing that if you have mo less than 90%, uh, you must be aware that that is already severe pneumonia. That is already an indication for you to bring yourself to the emergency room. And then the critical pneumonia or the critical COVID-19 are those patients who will require life-sustaining treatment, specifically mechanical ventilation, uh, to assist the, the lung from functioning because by then in critical pneumonia secondary to COVID, there is now diffuse inflammation of the lungs that will hamper the normal oxygenation or the normal breathing that, uh, that we need. Oh, and then aside from, aside from severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, a critical COVID-19 patient can also present with septic shock they can present with bleeding tendencies due to acute thrombosis. And for children, there is a disease entity that's called MIST-C, wherein they present with um, a generalized inflammatory disease that could not be explained by any other uh, pathologic mechanism. So, and then in the, in the, with the suspicion of COVID-19, they are classified as MIST-C. Okay, now the WHO considers asymptomatic mild and moderate without pneumonia as non-severe COVID-19. But more importantly, it is we have to remember that any of these um, entities in this spectrum can transmit the virus. So once again, very important, even asymptomatic, you can transmit the virus. So, but that is basically the reason why we need to remember that we still need to adhere with the minimum public health standards to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, you may be asymptomatic, you, didn't, you do not know that you have the virus. So we have to treat everybody as potential carrier of the virus 
that maybe you may remain asymptomatic, you may re, you may evolve into a symptomatic disease, but because of that, um, because of that principle that everybody can be infected, and um, even the asymptomatic can infect. That is the premise why we need to adhere with the minimum public health standards. And this consists of wearing the face mask and the face shield, keeping physical distance with other people of at least a meter, and then frequent hand washing or hand hygiene, especially after touching any parts of your face or touching any surface or any object, and then keeping interaction with other people to less than 15 minutes. And if I may say, if you need to interact with other people, Make sure that you have your face mask, your shield, and then you remind the person to um, politely, politely remind them to keep their mask on, keep their face shield on while you are talking. Now, on the right side, you will see an infographic of a study published in Lan Lancet just to show you the effectiveness of any of these uh, preventive measures. Physical distancing can actually lower the chance of getting um, COVID-19 from seven from 12.8% to 2.6%. Wearing face masks can lower the chance of getting COVID from 174 to 3.1%. And then wearing eye protection by way of a face shield can lower the risk or the chance from 16% to 5%. The, the face mask and the, and the shield is actually to cover our mucous membranes that are in our eyes, in our nose, and in our mouth because the receptors for SARS-CoV-2 are located in this mucous membrane. That is the reason why we need to cover our face. The, the receptors for the COVID, the SARS-CoV-2, are located in the mucous membrane lining our eyes, our nose, our mouth. So hence the reason for the face mask and the face shield. Now, individually, you can actually see from this study how, how effective they are. So if we are to use them um, as a group, we, we do physical distancing, we wear face masks, we wear, wear um, protection. You can just imagine that the chance or the risk of getting SARS-CoV-2 actually is very, very minimal, kept to a very minimum, if not um, zero. So this is the reason why we have a combination of uh, protective strategies. Second FAQs, how are COVID-19 patients treated or managed? Treatment or management depends on the classification of the illness based on the severity. And this was um, partially discussed by Sir Mario. So if you have mild disease, basically you just rest, you isolate symptomatic medications and you'll be well. If you have the severe or the critical, we will be giving more aggressive management because we want to um, <coughs> reverse the infection for a good outcome, which is um, survival. But what is common for all is that all COVID-19 patients are isolated to contain viral transmission or virus transmission. So this is for all types of COVID-19 um, patients. And then uh, when we manage COVID-19 patients, we are very dependent or we always put a high price on the risk factors for severe illness. So if we identify this in a patient, we know that this is a patient that we need to meticulously monitor that we need to watch out for because of the possibility of them evolving into severe, even critical illness. So the risk factors include age of 60 years old and above, smoking, uh, being overweight or obese, and then specific comorbidities like heart diseases, diabetes, chronic lung diseases, chronic kidney diseases, immunosuppressive um, uh, diseases like HIV or other autoimmune disease that will render a person immunosuppressed and then cancer. With regards to cancer, uh, our worry are those with cancer who are active cancer. They are still on treatment because we have been seeing patients, we have been managing patients with cancer, but those who have their cancer um, in remission are actually doing well they they survive they recover very well but those who are who have active cancer are those who are at risk of developing the severe or the critical illness so this is just to show you the clinical management if asymptomatic we don't advise admission stay home isolate for at least 14 days and then while on isolation you monitor your symptoms monitor your temperature 
it is a good investment actually to buy those gadgets, the pulse oximeter. Even the World Health Organization in their updated guidelines recommends that households or individuals, you get hold of the pulse oximeter, more so if you have somebody considered a vulnerable, a member of the vulnerable population in your family or in your household, um, you buy the pulse oximeter. Nowadays, you can buy them in pharmacies and boutiques, and they are becoming cheap, actually. And then more monitoring of the symptoms, especially if you are somebody with the risk factors for severe illness. And then we advise adequate nutrition, we advise rest, we advise hydration. And then for the mild, aside from the, th the steps that you consider here, um, you, you take symptomatic medicines, meaning symptom medicines depending on the symptoms. If you have fever or headache, you take paracetamol. If you have um, nasal congestion, you take um, a, a, a decongestant or an antihistamine. And similarly, you continue to monitor your symptoms. The moderate without pneumonia, the same management at home, it can be done at home, but there are emergency warning signs that you have to watch out for. And when any of these develop, this is your, this is your um, call, your red flag, that you have to either do teleconsultation or you have to go immediately to the ER. So this includes troubled breathing, persistent pain or pressure in the chest, confusion, inability to wake or stay awake, and then pale gray or blue colored skin, lips or nail beds, because this is a, a, a symptom of poor oxygenation in your body already. And then for those with moderate with pneumonia, uh, especially the elderly and those with comorbidities, we admit hospital admission. And then when they are admitted, we put them in the regular COVID floor. Um, we give oxygen if they require oxygen based on our laboratory examination, specifically the arterial blood gases. But we give them the oxygen through a simple nasal cannula. Sometimes we give them through the face mask. And then because there are elderly and with comorbidities, we do laboratory diagnostics. And then we have certain tests that can guide us uh, in, in determining if these are patients that uh, have the potential of developing, um, of, of progressing into severe or critical. And when we meet the criteria for such, we do give them medications or therapeutics, notably an antiviral we call remdesivir, and then anti-inflammatory medications like a steroid, dexamethasone, and tocilizumab. These are given to prevent the diffuse inflammation in the lung from progressing. And then we treat their comorbidities, their diabetes, their hypertension. We manage them, their kidney disease, their uh, chronic asthma, or their bronchiectasis, we manage them. And then we, we regularly and we more frequently monitor for worsening of signs and symptoms. And then for the severe infection, uh, we, these are the patients that, um, that has the, the, the potential of being transferred to the ICU because they may be those that have worse condition than the moderate. Same thing, we give oxygen supplementation, but this time for the severe, we consider them severe sometimes because um, when we give oxygen supplementation by way of the simple nasal cannula, their oxygen parameters do not improve. So we have to give it via a high flow nasal cannula and then or even the face mask. We give the same medication, and then although the data for convalescent plasma is still not robust, um, there are cases that we do offer them to the patient, especially if we see that in our monitoring, in our daily uh, monitoring, BB, we, don't, BCB, we don't seem to see the improvement, we offer convalescent plasma. So convalescent plasma is basically plasma from somebody who recovered from COVID-19. The principle being this plasma will contain antibodies, we call neutralizing antibodies, so they can neutralize the virus. So if this plasma is given to somebody who has active infection, the hope is the, 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 the neutralizing antibodies that are still present in the plasma will help neutralize the circulating SARS-CoV-2 in the infected person, and that will actually help um, treat or uh, manage the infection. And then uh, for severe, we recommend what we call self-proning. 
um, self-proning is asking the people to lie on their uh, tummy. Normally, we lie down on our back, no? For uh, that will that will not um, that is okay. That is the usual. But we have to remember that lying on our back when we breathe, that um, the, the 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 front side of our lungs, um, the oxygenation in the front side front portion of our lungs are okay. But you have to remember that in COVID-19 pneumonia, the pneumonia is diffused, it's all over. So when lying on your back, the back part of the lungs cannot, um, cannot the, the lung tissue or the alveoli cannot expand when we breathe. So this will actually lead to more hypoxemia. When we put the patient on their tummy, we allow the opening of the alveoli on the back part of the lungs and this will actually improve the oxygenation. We have seen this work. This has been validated. It has been proven that we do. In, it does improve the oxygenation of the those with severe pneumonia. And then we continue to monitor worsening of signs and symptoms. The critical COVID-19 are definitely in the ICU. Supplementation of oxygen if not cannot be done by high flow nasal cannula. These are those who are put into mechanical ventilation. And since they are on mechanical ventilation, we also put them on what we call induced coma. So we sedate them, we put them to sleep. And this is actually the, the psychologically um, very, very sad part because this is the time that um, we see patients um, bidding goodbye to their family because they will be put to sleep. And there is the worry that they might not wake up um, it's very, it has been very sad when we experience this because we usually tell patients that before we intubate you, you can talk to your family, you can tell them what you need to tell them because we will be putting you to If you remember, ivermectin is here. Now, I mentioned a while ago that Sir Mario mentioned about taking vitamins to prepare now. So actually that is good because for vitamins to be effective in immune boosting our immune system, it has to be vitamins that you have been taking for a long time. If you start taking the vitamins at the time that you become symptomatic for COVID-19, even the high dose of vitamin C or D and with zinc that you take only at the time that you become symptomatic or you become sick will not be beneficial. We know that vitamins will help boost our immune system. This is something that we have been supplementing ourselves with or taking for a long time. So that's basically the reason why high dose vitamin C and D is put in the, in the group of without evidence benefit. But for you, for you to prepare, you start taking the vitamins now. I am not saying that hopefully you, may you get a COVID-19, but hopefully, or not hopefully, but do get infected because you have been taking this as part of your supplements, that can actually help your immune system. And then therapeutics with some evidence of benefit include another viral called favipiravir, the convalescent plasma, and a procedure we call hemoperfusion, which is basically attaching yourself to a machine, um, getting out the, the, the pumping out the blood, cleaning it with the virus and other uh, molecules, and then putting it back in your body. Now, the most um, commercial issue or um, therapeutics is ivermectin. So I will have to deal with, I will have to present this to you. So ivermectin is an antiparasitic drug that has been proven to be effective for certain parasitic infections like onchocerciasis, the, the worm infections, and then scabies. It also has a potential anti-malarial effect. No? So these are the, the indications for ivermectin. Now, we are, if ivermectin is effective for these medications for a, with the, uh, under, if it is used in the recommended dose, which is basically very low dosaging. The proposed mechanisms of action of ivermectin for COVID-19 was born out of in vitro studies, meaning there, these are studies conducted in the laboratory, not on humans. And one of the important mechanisms that we, I hear people those who support ivermectin talk about is that it has a very potent antiviral um, effect. No, it can prevent the virus from replicating or multiplying. But remember, this is done in cell cultures. 
And in the studies in determining that it has this particular um, effect, they used doses of ivermectin that is 100 times higher than the usual dose we use for humans. So definitely, this is something that needs to be validated in human trials, in human studies. Indeed, there are human trials or researchers going on or have been done with ivermectin. But in totality, the results would show that the effects on mortality, mechanical ventilation, hospital admission, duration of hospitalization, and even viral clearance remain uncertain. Basically, the reason why so is because there is very low certainty of evidence that address this specifically. And this is coupled with the fact that in the published trials, and even those that are ongoing, the, the methodology is not um, scientifically at par with the science with, with how we do, how we conduct clinical trials. So Maura Mani ang ato ang argued against ivermectin. We do not have enough or a robust clinical scientifically proven evidence that ivermectin works. Because if we do, definitely mga doctor, kami mga doctor, we will be the one and the, the, the earliest to use this medicine because compared to the other therapeutics that are available, this is actually a very cheap option. But in the absence of clinical scientific evidence, we cannot, we cannot offer them as treatment for our patients. So I hope that will somehow shed light on the issue on ivermectin. Now I will have to jump because uh, we are pressed of time. The current status concerns with COVID-19 was the surge in cases. The one that is being seen in NCR are actually uh, mediated by the increase in the number of variants. And then the other concern, the other concern are the variants and the, 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 the has something to do with the vaccine. For you to know, this variant is not something that is unexpected. We know that this variant will, will emerge because um, mutation and emergence of virus is a property of viral or, or viruses. They have this very strong property to keep on mutating. This is the reason why until now, several viral infections, have, we do not have a cure for them. We don't have a cure for HIV. We don't have a cure for Hep B, for Hep C, uh, for uh, herpes simplex virus, basically because the virus can mutate. And when they mutate, escape uh, the effectiveness of the medicine. Now, these variants have the potential consequence of spreading more quickly, causing milder or severe uh, disease, and they might even lead to poor detection by the laboratory test and then possibly evasion of vaccine-induced immunity. So just to show you that variants happen because in the, vi in the life cycle of the virus, once inside, it is, the, it is inside the cell of a human host, it undergoes several steps as part of its replication or multiplication. All of these steps include um, uh, propagation or creation of new viral genomes. A simple nick, a simple twist, a simple omission or deletion of a sequence of the viral genome actually can result in the production of a variant. So that's why um, viruses with different spike proteins, with different RDRP genes will emerge, and those are basically the variants. Right now, we are talking of variants. Um, most of the variants have mutations in the spike protein. The spike protein in the virus is important because this will mediate the, the adhesion of the virus into the receptors in our mucous membrane. And then yeah, this is a very important part of the viral structure. So mutations here are, are causing the emergence of the new variant. Uh, important for you to know that one of the issues with variants is we might not be able to detect them by the, by the PCR test that we are using. That is wrong because the PCR test we are using targets several genes in the, in the virus. It targets the RDRP, the N gene, and the E gene, and of course, the spike gene. So because PCR test does not only detect the spike protein, the, the detection by the laboratory diagnostic test is not a problem. Here in the Philippines, we use a, a test called Sunsure. The, the target of the Sunsure are the RDRP, the ORF2, 
the N gene and the E gene. So specifically, basically, it will not evade detection. Uh, the, the, the virus will not evade um, detection by our laboratory diagnostic test. It's true that certain mutated, uh, certain mutations or certain variants are able to evade um, vaccine-induced immunity. And this has been proven in South Africa. In South Africa, in January, they started vaccinating their population using the AstraZeneca vaccine. And then when they detected the variant that contains the E484 mission, they did um, testing in the laboratory. They, they found out that those variants with the E484 mutation were not um, responsive to the vaccine. And with this information, their health ministry immediately halted the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then they shifted to another type of vaccine. Okay, so let me now go to myths that I would like to clear up with you. The first myth is that we cannot keep SARS-CoV-2 variants or future ones from spreading. This is a myth because actually we can. We know that uh, mutations will continue to happen in the virus, but if we continue with the protective strategies that we have been doing since last year, what these strategies will do is it will stop transmission. Because if we stop the transmission of the virus to another susceptible host, it will actually stop the virus from replicating. If we stop the virus from replicating, no mutation will happen. And if there is no mutation, no new variant will emerge. So the answer to stopping the variant from appearing from emerging is actually to practice the MPHS, the, multiple, the, the minimum public health standards, because it will prevent transmission. Preventing transmission will prevent replication in a new host. Preventing replication will prevent mutation. Preventing mutation will prevent new variants from emerging. So this is to show you um, why we are into vaccination or immunization. All these times since last year, we have, used, we have been using several strategies to prevent the transmission of virus. And it is best depicted in this uh, Swiss cheese model. If you are familiar with the Swiss cheese, when you slice through them, you will see layers with more holes, lesser holes as you go down. And then this is the virus with, with each strategy. Each strategy is not foolproof. The virus can still get into the body, but if you, um, practice several strategies together, you lower the chance of the virus affecting you. We are hoping that immunization by way of the COVID-19 vaccine will actually provide us with the best hope we have to prevent the virus from being transmitted to other people. Because if the virus cannot find a susceptible host, it will actually die by itself. So this is the reason why we are very hopeful on the COVID-19 vaccine and the vaccine deployment that our government has started. Okay, so a vaccine is a platform that delivers the antigen that can uh, stimulate our immune response by creating antibodies. This is just to show you the different vaccines we have. And then just for you to understand that we already have, we have been having 17 vaccines that are able to prevent 17 infections. The COVID-19 vaccine will be the eighth vaccine that can prevent um, an infection. How does the vaccine work? The vaccine contains the antigen injected into the body. It will stimulate the antigen presenting cell, which is a very specific cell of our immune response. The antigen presenting cell will stimulate what we call a T helper. cell. The T helper cell has two responses, two um, actions. It will stimulate the B cell to produce antibodies, and these antibodies will latch into the virus to inactivate them. The other response is to activate the T CD8 T cell that will stimulate the cellular response, which is the activation of our strong soldiers in the body, our macrophages, our neutrophils. These cells will capture the virus, engulf the, the virus, kill them. If they are not able to kill the virus inside them, they will send a signal to the B cell to send the antibodies to them, and then the antibodies will do the final neutralization of the virus. This mechanism of action is the same for any vaccine for organism, basically. So um, 
COVID-19 vaccine with regards to SARS-CoV-2, this is how it is, that how the, the infection uh, develops, the, the virus uh, is engulfed by the antigen presenting cells, and then it will stimulate the, the immune response. The vaccine will take the part of the virus itself to stimulate these specific cells, once again, to stimulate antibody production and to stimulate the cellular response. Vaccines have been proven to eradicate um, infectious disease exemplified by smallpox and polio. It can prevent infectious diseases. As I said, there are now 17 vaccine preventable diseases. It can halt epidemics. It has been proven to work in the Ebola outbreaks in the um, Democratic Republic of Congo and Zaire. And one of the important things that we would like to happen to see, we are hopeful will happen once we start uh, vaccinating people in our country is the production of herd immunity or what we call community immunity. Herd immunity is a type of acquired immunity. This develops from a natural infection or from immunization. Basically what happens is if an individual is infected with a pathogen, for example, a virus, the individual be immune to that virus so that the next time the virus uh, presents itself, he will not get sick. When you have natural, individual natural infections scaled up to the population, that will give you herd immunity. But in COVID-19, we cannot rely on natural infection to reach herd immunity, immunity because it is unethical and it will lead to deaths that is not, that should have been prevented so we do not do that. So we are relying on the COVID-19 immunization for us to be able to achieve herd immunity. Herd immunity is community immunity. It will uh, prevent the virus from propagating because more people are already immune to it. The immunity may be by way of a natural infection or by uh, immunization. We measure what we call herd immunity um, threshold. Um, there is a formula with it. You probably heard our leaders saying that we need to vaccinate 70 million Filipinos for us to achieve herd immunity. The formula is 1 minus 1 over R0. R0 is the basic reproduction number. This means that one infected individual can um, infect three others. The, the, the R0 for COVID-19 now stands at three meaning one infected person with COVID-19 can infect three, an average three secondary cases. So that is what it means by R0. So for us to be able to um, compute for herd immunity threshold, we use this formula 1 minus 1 over R0. So using the 2020 Philippine statistics with a 70% herd immunity threshold, we need to vaccinate 76 million Filipinos so that we will have herd immunity, we will pre prevent the, the virus from propagating and from transmitting, and the pandemic can actually end when we are able to do that. The vaccine development regulatory process has been shortened from the traditional of 10 to 15 years to about 1.5 years. This, is been, this has been done so because we need the vaccine right now because we are still in a pandemic. And this has been made, this was allowed by virtue of the omission of the preclinical trials because we already have preclinical information from the development of the original SARS CoV um, vaccine. And then the regulatory affairs has allowed the conduct of the human trials simultaneously or in parallel because in the traditional development pipeline, the clinical trials have to be done in sequential. Sequential Nisha, and this will this will take one to about three years or probably six years before the entire study is done. With COVID-19, the regulatory uh, agencies allowed the, the the parallel phase one, phase two, phase three, phase three. For some vaccine developers, they even start the production of the the, the vaccines already while they were still conducting the phase three. So this has been shortened to 1.5 years, and then um, the regulatory um, agency allows two specific um, outcomes, interim results, which is a 50% vaccine efficacy and two month safety data. And then they issue a what we call an emergency use authorization for the vaccine to become available for use. 
This is just to show you the different vaccine platforms that are used for COVID-19. Right now, we are using CoronaVac by Sinovac. This vaccine uses the whole vaccine inactivated virus platform. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines use the new kid in the block technology, which is the mRNA technology. The AstraZeneca vaccine, as well as the Gamalaya vaccine that will soon become available in the country, uses the non-replicating viral vector vaccine. So this is just for you to understand that each vaccine has different platforms. So notably, they will have different um, efficacy rates as well as safety profiles. List number two, mRNA COVID-19 vaccine will alter our DNA. This is a no. Our DNA is located inside the nucleus of our cells. The mRNA vaccines do not enter the nucleus at all, but is only up to the cytoplasm. The third myth is that COVID-19 vaccines were rushed and are therefore not safe. I mentioned a while ago, they were not rushed. They are rapidly developed because the regulatory affairs allowed the conduct or the, the, the parallel conduct of uh, clinical trials, human clinical trials, and there has been unprecedented involvement of study participants. Normally, when a clinical trial is conducted, it is very hard to recruit subjects, but with the COVID-19 vaccine development uh, studies, uh, people were volunteering themselves for the study. So this is the reason why we are able to develop the vaccine faster. Myth number four, aborted fetuses were used in making COVID-19 vaccines. So COVID-19 vaccines and the fetal cell line, these historical fetal cell lines were derived in the 1960s and the 1970s from two elective abortions that were not performed for the purpose of vaccine development. They were performed for the purpose of other uh, laboratory uh, researches, basically. Fetal cell lines were used to create vaccines for Hep A, rubella, rabies. For the COVID-19, the Gamalaya and the AstraZeneca vaccine utilized fetal cell lines. The use of the fetal cell lines is because viruses need cells to grow and they tend to grow better in cells from humans than animals. Fetal cells can be used longer. They are actually kept in the research laboratories. They are propagated and they can be used for any um, laboratory trials. But it is wrong to say that aborted fetuses were used to create um, COVID-19 vaccines. The emergency use authorization is granted so that the vaccines can now be used in groups of people at high risk for COVID-19 infection. So this is allowed, but we have to remember that the COVID, the EUA is not a full market ap application or a full market authorization. Having said that, this means that these vaccines cannot be sold commercially. You cannot buy them on your own. These are vaccines procured by the government or through the government, and they are given for free Currently, once these vaccines attain full market, uh, mar uh, full market authorization, this is when they become commercially available and can be sold in commercial pharmacies. This is a, just a tracker. We now have um, five, uh, uh, four vaccines with Philippine F uh, EUA, the Pfizer vaccine, AstraZeneca, CoronaVac, and then Gamalaya. The Indian vaccine, the, the vaccine from India, uh, already submitted application for EUA. It is still pending. For you to note that Moderna, Novavax, and the Janssen have not even submitted application for EUA. And we need them to have an EUA before they can be used in the country. This is just to show you that the trials of these vaccines continue. And this means that only after completion of their clinical trials can they be given a full market authorization, can they be sold in, uh, commercially. And I think this is the more important uh, information that you are awaiting, the comparison of the different vaccines that we have um, right now. Right now, we are using the CoronaVac from Sinovac. The CoronaVac has a 50.4% vaccine efficacy against asymptomatic illness. It has 100% vaccine efficacy against moderate and severe illness. True enough, the better efficacy are with Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. But when you go into protecting yourself against severe and critical illness, they basically have almost the same um, vaccine efficacy. So bottom line, whatever vaccine is offered to you, uh, you grab it because you do not know when the next vaccine becomes available. They may not have the same vaccine efficacy as well in terms of preventing uh, mild infection, 
but they are equal in terms of preventing moderate, severe, and critical infection. What is not in the table but is born out of the clinical trials that are still ongoing is that all these vaccines have 100% efficacy against death because none of the subjects in their studies who have been vaccinated have been reported to have died after having contracted the infection. The safety issues with regards to the vaccine with Pfizer and Moderna, the, the most severe form of allergic reaction is anaphylaxis. The, the causality has been determined, but the recommendation is still to use it because the benefits outweigh the risk. With the Astra vaccine, we have been hearing reports of clots, blood clots. Um, there is still no firm um, resolution if it is indeed caused by the vaccine, but the regulatory affairs have decided to label this blood collapse as a very rare serious adverse event of the vaccine. And the recommendation remains to continue with the vaccination because the benefits outweigh the risk. For the coronavirus, there has been no serious adverse effects reported, but we will continue to monitor because it has been deployed in our country as well as in other countries. This is just a real world experience of how vaccination in, in Israel has been shown to decrease the number of cases of COVID-19, even the number of hospitalizations in their elderly population. In the US, when they started their vaccination, they started in the nursing homes because most of the deaths were in those people in the nursing homes. And they have shown data that indeed it has decreased the number of new cases in the nursing homes. It has decreased the number of um, deaths secondary to COVID-19 in the nursing homes. So these are real world experience. So now back to our country, our government, the DOH, already deployed the national deployment, the national vaccination program. This is a screenshot of the summary of the priority or the eligibility criteria for the COVID-19 vaccine. You, all of you here who are in the who are working as a healthcare worker, you are considered A1, so you must have received the vaccines already. The senior citizens, some areas in the country have started um, vaccinating the seniors and those with comorbidities. And then along the line, we are hoping that we will be able to vaccinate everybody in the population, or at least 70% of the population for us to achieve herd immunity. It is true, it is not a myth that you can still get infected with COVID-19 after you receive the vaccine. The reason for this is that the infection was already present or evolving before you got the vaccine because it will take seven to 21 days after you receive the vaccine for your immune system to develop antibodies that are good enough to protect you, or the protective immunity has not been developed yet um, when, during the time you, you were exposed to the virus. As of April 6, I could not get a more recent um, infographic. The DOH reported 2.5 million doses of vaccines have been deployed and used in our population, and that the average daily seven-day average of vaccinated indiv individuals stands at around 23,000. This is actually a very low number. If we are to vaccinate 70%, this is very slow pace, Muranisha turtle or hare, no? Um, as of yesterday, the WHO said that about 734 million vaccine doses has been administered. Unfortunately, we are not in the same boat. We are in the same storm, but some countries have yaks, so they are able to be to vaccinate more of their population. Some countries have banka like us. We are very slow in procuring vaccines, or we are very slow in our vaccination program. Our target is 76 million Filipinos. At the current age, average daily rate of vaccination, it will take us nine years to reach our target of 76 million. We cannot allow this. So it is very important that we call out our government to make the vaccines available. They promised that by June, we will have enough vaccines for the 70 million. We really need to keep the noise to really um, call out the government to provide it to us. If you are given the chance to be vaccinated, grab it. Do, if you are a high-risk individual, you belong to the A category, grab it. Even if it is coronavirus, it has only 50.4% against a mild disease, grab it because you do not know when you will get the chance or you will be given the chance later on. While we do this, 
we continue to do the minimum public health standards because again, we still need, we are still in a pandemic. It has not stopped. We need to stop the transmission of the virus. I think this is my last uh, slide. I am very sorry for the technicalities and uh, thank you very much for your attention. And then I give the floor back to Jojo and the moderators. Thank you very much, Dr. Faith. That was a very interesting, enlightening and detailed and at the same time, scientifically proven uh, data. So yes. we have, Chap Joe, we have several questions here, no? and uh, most of it, though, were answered, but uh, I believe some needs more uh, elaboration. And firstly, yeah, let's, uh, ask, uh, let's ask Dr. Faith if she can accommodate a few questions. Doc, is that all right? Yes, sir. No problem. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, bro. All right. So basically, uh, one concern here is that in Manila, they have, how do you call this, the, the healthcare system was overwhelmed, no? And uh, based on the situation in Cebu, it's not yet overwhelmed and we are in the good, we're still in in uh, in good hands. Is that correct, Doc Faith? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So basically, the the, the system can still accommodate the, the, okay. the cases, right? Yeah. Yes. So if I may add to that. What happened in Manila, Mangod, um, number one, it is mediated by the variant, the variant. The other thing, Mangod, in Manila, when the people got sick, immediately they went to the hospitals. Um, it is only now or only recently, they actually, they, they adopted what we did here in Cebu when we opened up CPMF or the isolation and the quarantine facilities because most of those who are actually seek admission in hospitals in Manila do not really need to be in the hospitals. And they need to understand this because those who have severe and critical infections, those we hear about who are dying in the tent, they are supposed to be inside the hospital. The problem is now overwhelmed because the mild, the moderate without pneumonia got to the hospital first were admitted. So now they are now implementing what we did. They are now encouraging people with mild, moderate without pneumonia to go to the TPMF. They actually followed the practice here in Cebu. We have been commended for what we did here in Cebu, and they are following it in Manila. That's good, right. no, Doc. We have very good, good isolation centers, right? And uh, the, the use of the hotels are really, yes. how do you call it, improve the, the yes. facility and uh, the availability of the facility for severe patients. Yeah, Chap Joe, yes. you have a question on your... Yeah, there's a... Yeah, there's a question here, a simple question. Uh, some some of those who have already been vaccinated are asking if if they mix vaccines, meaning they'll change the brand. Is that uh, what's your advice on that? Is that okay, Doc? Okay, it is not advised at all. The vaccine makers do not advise it. The WHO and the other regulatory uh, agencies do not recommend it for the simple reason that that has not been proven to work. Theoretically, we would say it will work, but that has not been proven. So the recommendation is no. But for everybody to know that there are ongoing studies right now, notable is the one done in UK, they mix the vaccines, they use the Astra and the Pfizer. We will await for the, for the results of that study because it will prove that it can be done. Or so the, these na. are very specific vaccines, Astra and Pfizer. So we are hoping that the other the other vaccine the other vaccine developers will conduct similar studies because that will actually guide us if we can do it. Thank All you right, for right. that, Doc. Thank no? you. Thank yeah. You. So there's a, a another question here. Uh, I believe the vaccine is now ready for the adults, right, uh, including the senior citizens. So the question is, how about the children and the pregnant women? Yeah, those are okay. some of the questions. Thank you very uh, much, sir, for that question. Okay. All of the vaccines we have right now are not recommended for below 18 years uh, old simply because the clinical trials conducted for these vaccines did not include that population, that age group. No? But Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, as well as other vaccines are currently doing studies on children. There have been preliminary press releases from Pfizer and Moderna saying that their vaccine works for the children. But we will have to await for the full result and then follow, what will follow will be guidance if they can be used. For pregnant women, as with other vaccines, we do not recommend vaccines for pregnant women in the first trimester. 
they can be given the vaccines after the first trimester. And then we do not give pregnant women in any trimesters the live vaccine. The vaccines we have for COVID right now are not live, so they can be used. So if you are beyond your first trimester and you are in the eligible group for vaccines, like for example, if you are a healthcare worker, we will offer it to you actually, but it is your decision for you to get it or not. I personally recommend that if you are a high risk, you are A1 because you are a nurse, you handle uh, patients of COVID, you are beyond uh, first trimester, get the vaccine. Thank you for that, Doc. No? Thank you. Doc, Doc, you have yeah. questions in line? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Doc, uh, there's a question here. Uh, how long is the immunization after you're vaccinated? And then are there any cases wherein a vaccine should not be given? Okay. The only contraindication to any of the vaccine is an allergy to that vaccine. Meaning you receive the first dose of, say, for example, coronavirus, you develop anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the most severe form of reaction. You cannot receive the second, do a second dose of coronavirus. So these are the individuals that we worry about because we do not know what to do with them. That's why we also wait for the trial results on mixing vaccines because the, theoretically the, the, the recommendation would be to use another type of vaccine. That is the only contraindication. Those with allergy to food, other drugs, you can accept, you can receive the vaccine, but um, the vaccine sites have been mandated to prepare treatment rooms in case you develop um, reactions, you will be managed accordingly. There is a health screening form. You are counseled. What will happen? You have your given expectations of what, what might be happen. And if something does happen, you are actually given uh, treatment. The first question is how long before the immunity develops after vaccination? Yeah. Is that how long can you be immune from COVID after vaccination? Okay. The current information we have is after you have completed the doses of the vaccine, the immunity will last three months. The reason why three months only is because once again, the trials continue to be, are continuing. So the, the, the subjects who were vaccinated in the trials, they were monitored and they were found out that at three months, they still have the immunity. Later on, maybe in the next few months, we will probably be hearing from these um, vaccine developers that the, the immunity can last up to six months, up to 12 months, because once again, they continue to monitor those who are being vaccinated. And this is the reason why we continue to wear the mask, because we are still not sure how long the immunity will last or how durable it will be. We are hopeful, theoretically, me speaking as an ID, it should last a minimum nine to 12 months, but we, we, we need the, the, the kind of solid data for us to be able to convince people that if you will be immune up to that long. Thank you, Doc, no, for you. clarifying you. the myths and uh, stating the facts is very important because uh, we need to base everything on science, no? And uh, experts' uh, advice is very important in this matter. So, Doc, uh, the question here is that if you are contracted with COVID and you already recovered, uh, meaning to say you already have the immunity, right? So, yes. how long that does immunity that does that immunity last, and how long does that patient needs to wait before he can or he or she can uh, get the vaccine? Okay, so thank you very much for that. Days and so on and yes. so forth. So we need to clarify. There are so many school of thoughts, though. Okay, Sige. thank you very much, sir. Uh, like any other viral infection, after you are infected, you develop what we call, call post-infection immunity. And general rule, on average, post-viral infection immunity will last for three months or 90 days. So ato nang the, same, the same principle is being used with COVID-19. Because of the three months or 90 days, this was used as the basis for our Department of Health to say in their initial guidelines to recommend that those of us who have been infected, you have post-viral transient immunity up to nine days, do not get the vaccine for yet. Let us give the vaccine to those who do not have immunity because we have limited vaccines. So that was the initial guidelines. We have to wait for 90 days. 
But because vaccine stocks are trickling in, the government is very sure that we will have vaccines trickling in. Only recently, about three weeks ago, they put out a new memo or circular saying that you don't need for 90 days, you don't need to wait for 90 days uh, for you to be in injected. Meaning, once you have recovered from your infection, you have completed the 14 days isolation for mild or the 20, 21 days for severe critical, and you have recovered clinically, you can actually accept the vaccine or receive the vaccine already if it is offered to you. So no more 90 days waiting. Well, thank you for that, Doc. No? Uh, very insightful and clear, clear path towards uh, vaccination. So, Chap Joe? Yeah, Brother Albert, we can have uh, time for I think two more questions, then uh, we'll be good. Last All two right. questions. Yeah, uh, anyway, there's a question that just came in. Uh, what about a, uh, those patients who are bedridden and cannot go out of their house? Uh, can the vaccine be uh, done in the house? Or okay. what's your take on that? Okay. The, the DOH, the Department of Health uh, Deployment Guidelines, says that the LGUs or the local government units down to the barangays is responsible for identifying bedridden individuals in the household and they are responsible for administering the vaccines at home. So basically, because these people cannot be brought to the vaccination site, so it is the responsibility of the barangays and I am hoping that they're already doing that already creating the master list on who is who are the bedridden and they will create a process that they will go house to house and vaccinate these people. Well, All right, thank good, you. No? Thank you, Doc. Back to you, bro. One more that's question. The uh, inside doc, no? Yeah. Uh, service at its best, no? Uh, well, yeah. uh, the question here is about uh, testing. Uh, I believe RT-PCR is the standard and uh, the, the well-accepted test. But of course, uh, and in the house, there are what we call uh, rapid tests available in the market. And one of which is what we call the saliva test, antigen saliva test. Uh, can you recommend that? Or do you recommend okay. that kind of test in the absence okay. of the RT-PCR? Okay. Yeah. I uh, omitted this in if you remember in my surveillance definition slide on the WHO I omitted it because I'm hoping I will be able I will be given the chance to discuss it rapid antigen test is actually allowed by WHO for testing but it is allowed for asymptomatic suspect cases if you don't have symptoms and you use the rapid antigen test and it is positive you are considered a suspect the rapid antigen test is also used for uh, confirming, actually they already use it for confirmatory tests, but they're very specific. These are for people who have, who are, who are symptomatic, who fulfill the criteria of probable, and who have no access to the RT-PCR test. But the WHO is also very clear in that this should be rapid antigen tests that have been validated to be uh, as equal or perform as good as the RT-PCR. So we need to remember that, that not all rapid antigen tests are created equal. No? So if you use that at your, in your home, you go to the uh, website of the Philippine FDA, they have a listing of the rapid antigen tests that have been validated by the DOH, and these are the tests that actually you can use. But if what you are using is not in the validated list, you cannot rely on that as a um, to guide you if you say, I am not infected or not. So these tests have to be validated against the gold standard, which is the RT-PCR. For us to say, uh, it is as good. So once again, they are not created equal. So for the rapid antigen test using the saliva, the same. The saliva test needs to be validated against the RT-PCR. In the US, they have very good rapid antigen tests actually. These are top quality actually. If the same brands actually come to our country, arrive in the country, no question about that. We can use that. But unfortunately, those brands are not available locally. 
Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rafate. No, that's a that's a very insightful at the same time informative for all of us uh, uh, laymans, uh, not not in the medical practice. It's good that uh, we have this kind of session and talk. No, we're very fortunate for that. Uh, Chapdo, uh, last two questions, one for you and one from me. Okay, Chapdo. Uh, yeah, uh, very simple question. No, for our for our participants here, we would like they would like to know. Uh, if they have uh, more questions, no, where can they get help? Like, uh, is there a base, uh, a standard information source that they can inquire? And uh, and uh, in the in, in addition to that, is are there online consultations here in Cebu? Uh, for the reference for updated and reliable information, I recommend the Department of Health website. Um, they have everything there. They have uh, a section um, focused on COVID-19. They have a uh, case bulletin, vaccine tracker, uh, information on treatment. Everything is there. And then, basic, and then aside from the COH, you can actually go to the WHO website. The same thing. They have, they have all the information. That is better than uh, relying on what your neighbors tell you or what you hear or what you read in SOCMED. There are what we call medical societies. I, I, I belong to the Philippine Society for Medical, uh, for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. We do have our presence in SOCMED. We made sure that we have SOCMED presence because we know that SOCMED is a, an area where ideas and information is exchanged. And it is actually alarming how fake news and uh, wrong information is shared in SOCMED. So that is the reason why our society, as well as the other medical societies, decided to put our presence in this, in this arena. So we put out regular um, information in our Facebook page. <laughs> we have a PISMID Facebook page, as well as the other medical societies. With regards to teleconsult, I do not have a direct um, link that I can give you, Joe and everybody, but I do know that there are doctors who are doing teleconsult. Unfortunately, I do not do teleconsult. I have also limited my clinical practice, my clinic, because I have to attend to uh, patients in the, in the hospital. So it's not, it, it, it cannot be done that I have to do regular clinic and then make rounds on patients. So I had to cut it down. But I do know that there are doctors who, um, do teleconsult. What I can do for you is I can ask the Cebu Medical Society if there is a link and then I can share it with you guys through Jojo or maybe Dr. Manny Wanilio and then you can share it in your community. Thank you, Doc. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. The good thing is uh, I saw your presentation. Uh, two things that I like most is the COVID home. Uh, uh, COVID home okay. care algorithm is really nice, no? And uh, uh, it can help, and maybe the the group can also take note of that. And also the clinical management of COVID nineteen. Uh, it's a science based. It's a really good uh, material, and uh, maybe you can share that to us, doc, and we can share it to the group. Then uh, last question, doc, is that uh, although there are so many questions, but of course in the interest of time, uh, you know there is some what we call needs that once you're vaccinated, you're good, or people tend to relax because the incidence is very low. So maybe you can give your final advice to all the, the viewers and the members now uh, uh, dialed in, no? because it's very important that they get the advice from the expert. Dr. Faith, your words on that. that is, thank you, sir. Actually, that is the effect of the immunization. And then um, actually in the US, because they have a, a, a big portion of the population already vaccinated, they're actually, they already have guidelines on opening up um, businesses because in areas where the vaccination has been, the, the vaccination rate has been high. The Centers for Disease Control already put out um, guidelines that in the household or in your bubble, like for example, in a BCBP community, if all of you are vaccinated already, you can actually remove the, the, the face mask and the shield already if all of you are vaccinated because it works. The vaccination can prevent transmission. If it does not 100% prevent transmission, it will prevent you from getting sick. So these are the effects of the vaccination that we 
we we will we will expect the problem is in the community like in the country if only a few are vaccinated we cannot make such guidelines still that is the reason why we are calling for our our citizens to have yourself vaccinated we are hoping that we are able to convince those with vaccine hesitancy the anti vaccinators to have yourself vaccinated because you will be part of the solution to us gaining our herd immunity once we have a big portion of the community vaccinated we will actually get into that scenario that we can go out uh, we can go to the mall we will be able to take out our mask our shield but until such time that we are um, sure that we have vaccinated enough of the population we will have to continue to monitor uh, to, to adhere to the minimum public health standards but once again we are hoping if we vaccinate everybody kung allowed lang you vaccinate everybody we will eventually get there that is our hope and our prayer